Um, so as Ashley said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about cancer MDTs, but because it's the last talk of the day, um, I'm going to get you to do some work, I'm afraid. So I know everyone's got a smartphone, I think, or an iPhone or, or a, an iPad. Um, so I would like you, if you haven't already, to um, log on to the Wi-Fi, Cavendish Wi-Fi, and the password is 1234CAV. I'm sure you're already on it, aren't you? Because you've all updated your Facebook status. Um, and then um, we're going to use um, an app, well it's not an app, it's a, it's a web-based program called Slido, which some of you may have used already. Um, so all you need to do is open your browser, I'm going to do it at the same time so we can all uh, check it works with Richard upstairs. And right, so um, this talk is really going to be about MDTs. What is the cancer MDT? What differences do MDTs make? And then when I hand over to my uh, partner in crime, Jane, she's going to be talking a little bit about how patients should be involved with MDTs how patients do them. So starting off with what is an MDT, when I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, you know, as you do, go into Google Images and see if you can find a nice infographic that will encapsulate exactly what a, an MDT is. But unfortunately, these were things that came up. So the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, 2013, the Miller Dream Team Professional and Personalized and Roofing Company, um, the Miracle Drug Therapy, I thought was an interesting one. And then there was one that said, Mysterious Decisions About Treatment, which I That's thought was, really yes, I thought, yeah, yeah, that was an interesting, um, an interesting one. So an MDT, um, stands for multidisciplinary teams, I'm sure many of you know, um, and this is sort of what it looks like, and essentially it's a group of professionals uh, that meet usually once a week um, in a very dark group, because we like to look at scans and the radiologists like to turn on the lights down, um, and we discuss patients essentially, so patients at the time of diagnosis, patients at the time of a, an assessment response, patients at the time of relapse, um, and the group consists mainly of radiologists, so the x-ray doctors, uh, the oncologists that make the decisions about the chemotherapy, usually a radiotherapy doctor as well, who may um, comment about the radiotherapy aspects, surgeons as well, clinical nurse specialists, um, and those are the ones that normally tend to be involved in an oncology um, uh, MDT for, for children's cancer. Obviously there are different types of MDTs, there are late effects ones where we concentrate on obviously late effects and there may be a, a hormone doctor involved in those types of uh, MDT discussions. There are also psychosocial MDTs, there's lots and lots of different types. Um, the ones I'm going to mainly be talking about are the, are the treatment decision ones um, about um, at the time of diagnosis. So, in terms of background, and, and Kath has alluded to some of the changes that have really come in as <coughs> cancer intelligence o over the years, and how we've moved very much from individuals treating patients to much more of a team, team approach. Um, and now there's probably about 1,500 cancer MDTs in the whole of England, and that obviously encompasses adult uh, cancers as well. And they have now become, as a result of NICE and all of the guidance about improving outcomes, a real central tenet of cancer services because it has been shown that actually working in a team rather than in isolation makes a huge difference to patient outcomes. But the problem with it from a research point of view is actually MDT research is very much adult focused. There's obviously there's 1,500 cancer MDTs and most of them are going to be adult based. And it's very difficult because it's quite a difficult concept to actually assess how they work and how what impact they have. So the requirement, as I mentioned, is, is really sort of set in stone by um, bodies such as NICE. And the, primary aim is really to bring together those health professionals with that expertise and knowledge and to make decisions that really kind of make a difference to what a patient should be seeing in their, in their family. The research that's been done in adults has been shown in different types of cancers to do some of these things. So changes in staging and diagnosis, as you might expect, certainly when a team gets together to look at um, some imaging, those, those differences are, are noted. MDTs have been shown to have a better, improve the adherence to clinical guidelines, so more guidelines are being followed if, they, if patients are discussed within an MDT team. They have been shown for certain cancers, such as lung cancer and breast cancer for adults, to show better survival. So previously, when uh, for something like lung cancer, some patients were having surgery, some weren't, and there was a huge geographical variation. And again, comparing the UK to Europe, as, as Kathy alluded to as well, there were big differences, and having an MDT seem to show uh, an improved survival. Clinical trial entry, again, one of those things that can also be discussed in the team environment, and entities have been shown to show a higher rate of, of, of entry. And just 
making those initial treatment plans and making things happen quickly, um, again, having that team um, really supports that. So there's been some research uh, that's come out quite recently, um, at the beginning of this year, done by uh, Cancer Research UK, which is talking about meeting patients' needs. So thinking about how to improve the effectiveness of the multidisciplinary within cancer services. And they had an overwhelming 2,000, over 2,000 responses, but only 54 of them, as you might expect from the very rare group that we are, uh, from children and young people's MDT members. And there weren't any MDTs from pediatrics that were observed and no interviews, whereas they obviously interviewed lots and lots of, of, of adult um, MDTs. But the sort of findings, I think, are quite generalizable. Um, one of the things that they said was that there was not enough to time to discuss complex patients. And the mean length of discussion of, of these primarily adult patients was 3.2 minutes. They also said that the MDT meeting attendance was not optimal. So again, from NICE and IAG and other bodies, the attendance um, in England is meant to be 66% of all meetings. So core members are meant to be at 66% of all meetings. Um, but actually that wasn't being met in, in many cases. They often talked about how the right information wasn't available to, to aid those discussions and actually then that patient would have to be deferred to another week because they didn't have all the information there. And lastly, which is the focus really of what we're going to be talking about today, is only 14% of the observed discussions actually involve patient-centred information. And that really talks about how the fact that patient individual preferences weren't really being taken into account when discussing what treatment options were available to them. So, you'll know about Slido now. So, I would like you to go on Slido. The event code is the same. Um, and there's going to be a poll. Um, and what I'd like you to do is just think to yourself whether you're an MDT voice or a patient voice. Um, hopefully, that should be fairly obvious. Um, so, if you sit on an MDT or you've been involved in an MDT or you're on the, uh, the uh, sort of healthcare professional side of this, then please answer the question for. Um, MDT voice, and if you're representing the patient voice, whether you're a parent, grandparent, um, or uh, another representative, then please answer this question from the patient voice. So it's essentially saying patient family views should always inform the decision making process. So you can see the results on your phones. So essentially, the patient voice participants 88% agreement, 3% disagree, and 9% don't know. And for the MDT participants, 74% agree. 11% disagree and 15% don't know. Um, and I'm just going to show you the results from our survey. Um, so this, um, exactly the same question was asked of um, MDT members in uh, from CCLG centres um, and patients that were involved in the Ewing's MDT, which Joan is going to speak about shortly. And you can see it's pretty similar to the results that we've had here. So majority did agree that patient and family you should inform the decision making process where there was a couple of people that were thinking not quite sure about this. When we asked the same question about whether or not patients and family should have, actually have the opportunity to attend, you can see this, is, this was a big difference between the MDT voice and the patient voice, where most patients thought that they should have the opportunity in principle, if that was possible, whereas uh, a much higher proportion of the MDT participants felt uh, that they disagreed that shouldn't be part of, uh, part of the MDT process. So I'm going to hand over to Jane now, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the work we've been doing with the Ewing's MDT. Hello, my name is Jane, and I am the mummy of Daisy, who you can see at the top there, and Toby and Daisy at the bottom. Um, my daughter, when she was about eight, so that was back in 2014, the end of 2014, started to complain of leg pain, um, which I put down to growing pains, obviously. Um, however, my husband persuaded me to go to the doctors, and they referred us on to hospital, and eventually a biopsy confirmed that she did have Ewing sarcoma, which is bone cancer, and it was in her right tibia on her right leg, the big, thick shin bone. Um, that threw us in to a huge maelstrom of Hickman lines, ovarian preservation surgery, which still sounds something like out of Star Trek to me, um, 
trial randomizations. Um, we went for the trial randomization. We were offered the Euro Euro's 2012, which is the American way or the English way. The American way is very intensive. Um, we had nine inpatient chemos to begin with. Um, so we were in for three days at a time and six days at a time, starting every other Tuesday. So we were in hospital an awful lot. Um, in order for her to be ready for all those chemos, she had to have something called GCSF injections, which you may or may not be aware of, which is daily screamathons, basically, because um, they're pretty hideous injections. Um, the only way I could get through it was by chunking it out into bits. So we got the nine chemos out of the way, and then we went on to surgery. Um, she had tibia graft surgery in May 2015. They took her fibula from her left leg, they took that out, and they spun it around, chopped out the tumour and the tibia and put it into her right leg. Um, no amount of explaining to a nine-year-old as she was then that she was going to not be able to use her legs when she woke up after that surgery. Even I could barely comprehend how traumatic that was going to be. She found that pretty hideous. We then ended up in a round of infections. We got MRSA, we got staph everything, we were on mountains of antibiotics, it was all a bit of a nightmare. So we then had another five inpatient chemos, um, which ended August 2015. Now, I don't know whether for any parents here, but that coming out of hospital and finishing that treatment is a little bit like falling off a cliff. You really kind of feel like, where is the life raft? <laughs> because it's well and truly gone. Um, we still had masses of infections, masses of vomiting. In fact, it got so bad that Daisy managed to put herself in hospital about five or six times through vomiting. Um, we got to the point in December, January 2015, where we had an open wound where we could see bone, three screws, metal plates. It was horrendous. Um, I eventually persuaded the plastic surgeon that actually we couldn't live with this wound and we had to have the metal work taken out. So that was taken out. We then had her leg bowing, so we couldn't carry on like that. So we then had to have metal work in, in October 2016. Um, and then we finally got the vomiting under control. We'd had everything. We'd had masses of anti-sick drugs, masses of stomach lining drugs. We'd had exclusion diets. We'd had barium li meal live imaging. The only thing that stopped her was when the gastroenterologist turned around and said, right, I am going to put you under a general anaesthetic and we're going to do an endoscopy. She was so petrified of another general anaesthetic, she virtually stopped vomiting overnight. It was all anxiety. She had, in her own little head, it was all anxiety. So we're now under a psychology team as well. Um, January 2017, uh, the, one of her bones in this right leg had stopped growing completely where we'd had the tibia surgery but the fibula continued to grow, so we banged a nail in that to stop it. So that leg's now not growing. So we now have TBC leg lengthening surgery, and that will happen in a few years' time. Um, one bit I omitted to mention is that we also got randomised after our surgery um, in our trial for something called zoledronic acid, which we had for nine months. So that started in June 2015 and ended in Feb 2016. So it's been quite a journey that we've been on. She's now 11. Um, this is her now, yeah? Um, this was taken a few weeks ago. She's been happy, smiley, she's walking. It's all great. We have finally got rid of all the wheelchairs, walking trains, crutches, all of that. Um, and not forgetting in all of this, there is a, my son, Toby, who has been amazing, and I'm constantly on the watch for when all the fallout's going to happen with him, because it will, I'm sure. Um, so, as if that all wasn't good enough reason to get involved in the research. Um, I feel an immense need to give something back. I'm really grateful to all of the health professionals involved. I've had a really, despite all of that, I've had a really good journey. The hospital professionals have been amazing. They have treated Daisy, myself, the whole family with the utmost of respect. They have been fantastic. Um, and I would just really want to do anything that promotes a smooth journey for everyone because not everybody does have a good journey. Um, Post-treatment has been harder because all that random stuff that happened after her treatment, 
there was no structure to it. Being in hospital and on chemo, you know, when you're going in, you do it. You know, when you're coming out, you can plan for all of that. You can't plan for what happens afterwards. Um, and everyone has such a different journey. Some people have brilliant journeys. Some people have downright difficult journeys. Some people have final journeys where um, the unthinkable happens. So, this is our group. <laughs> we are a really diverse group of individuals. In fact, one of my colleagues, yes, here, here he is. There's a little chap here. Welcome. He's here today. He's with us. Um, so we are, this is, this is a photograph that was taken just recently from one of our meetings. Um, so we've got lots of people in this group. There's quite a few health professionals in here. Here you go. This, this um, and this lady is a nurse. And we've got people here who were diagnosed a long time ago, people who've been diagnosed recently, uh, bereaved parents, not bereaved parents, um, and people who have a lot of um, late effects. So this gentleman is a long time post-treatment, as is this gentleman, um, as is this gentleman is here, Chuck Ian, he's about five years post-treatment. Um, so yeah, we are a pretty diverse bunch of individuals. Um, but all interesting and all with amazing stories. So, themes from our focus group. We met back in January 2017, first of all, and we talked about the understanding of the MDT and we all sort of shared our stories and thoughts. And we talked about making choices, how and were we able to, and communication, how were we communicated to and were we communicated to. Um, so, these are some quotes from the, the themes of that me meeting. Now, these are not all my quotes, I have to say. Um, so, some people felt, sorry, some people felt there was an air of secrecy and being spoken to behind closed doors and that they weren't privy to the information that was being discussed about their case. Some felt like they were just another patient. They felt a, a bit of a conveyor belt, a cog in a process. It was all a bit impersonal. Some felt that there was too much medical jargon being used. Um, nothing was really explained to them properly, and this can obviously lead to added anxiety on your journey, which is already painful enough to be going through. Um, and some people even felt there was a lack of expertise within the MDT. Um, and that's quite worrying, because these are the meetings that are there to help you to either save yours or your child's life. So if, if there are people who feel that that's the case, that's quite tough. Um, so people's understanding of the MDT was pretty varied. Um, some people from quotes here, logistically in hospital, it's quite difficult to get all the professionals together. A lot of our treatment op options were depending on those discussions. Sort of didn't feel there was a matter of urgency, a sense of urgency around their treatment. Often I thought they were not going to meet again for two weeks and you've missed the opportunity. Waiting around for decisions is really scary. It raises your anxiety levels because everyone tells you childhood cancer is really aggressive. So all that time you're waiting, you're thinking, okay, it's all getting bigger. Everything's getting bigger. Everything's getting harder to treat. And so you, you panic. You feel, you feel it rising. I feel it rising now. Um, some people think they're only going to discuss your child. Well, as you can tell from what Jessica said earlier, you can see from you might get three minutes to discuss your case. So that's, that's not a lot of time. So making choices, um, one quote was, it was a conversation with a consultant who had already decided what he wanted to do. There, didn't, there was no exchange and brokering. Didn't feel there was any choice in what was happening with their treatment. Um, another quote was around radiotherapy, giving the family the skills and knowledge to have some kind of ownership over their treatment. And another comment here, I'd want to know everything and whatever they'd agreed, it's what they would recommend. Some have an absolute faith in what's being decided and we'll just go with that because they're the professionals. So it's clear from these comments that patients and parents are really different. Um, some have a blind faith and some just want to have more decision within that whole process. So communication, you establish a relationship with your clinician. To get bad news from another person is worse than to get it from the ones that you know. You build an immense rapport with the people who treat you. 
or treat your child. And trust is so important. You trust the people who you're treating. To get bad news from somebody you don't know is really tough. Um, some doctors have a higher emotional intelligence than others. Medical school is great, but they don't really teach that. Um, and emotional skills are really important, and delivery is key in the information that you're being told. And it's also key to your experience and your ability to process what you're being told. Um, this is actually one of mine. <laughs> My daughter had complex surgery, and I was keen to know if anyone had other ideas about how to approach her surgery. Um, so people want different levels of communication. Some want lots, some want a little, um, and the way and nature of the delivery is key. I mean, I was very lucky. I actually had the mobile phone number of my daughter's plastic surgeon, so when we had our open, gaping, robocop wound, instead of having to go to the hospital every couple of days, I used to text him a photograph of her wound every 48 hours so that we could keep a record of what was going on. And as soon as he saw anything he didn't like, he said, right, we're coming in tomorrow. And so I would go to the hospital. So it saved him time, saved me time, saved everybody time. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Back to Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Jane, for sharing the, those insights. So just to conclude, really, as, as, as we've talked about, the purpose of the Cancer MDT is to make these very individualised treatment recommendations. But actually, the patient who is the centre, your child or you as a patient, really needs to be integral to that process and a huge part of it. And, and historically, we've not really invited patients and families to be part of those MDT discussions. It can be that we make recommendations and they're verbally conveyed to a family or perhaps sometimes written, uh, written recommendations. But actually their choices and their preferences are not always discussed. And I think, you know, looking back sort of how things have changed, we didn't used to have parents being allowed to be staying on the wards because it was considered, you know, in the way of the nursing staff and how, you know, how could we possibly let, let uh, you know, another bed next to another bed when we're trying to deliver care. And I sort of think that a little bit the same about MDTs is actually in the future, I think patients will be an integral part of it in a very open, uh, open way and be able to voice their concerns and, and voice their preferences in a way that will really influence what decisions are made about their care. And I think Jane's really demonstrated how collaborative patient-led research can be because actually the voice of the patient is really the integral part of this whole conference and thinking really about how we need to frame our research questions about what patients and families really want. Thank you.